Ah uh, yes, the AMD Fury, most people knowing it as AMD's last competitive high-end graphics card that lingered on, but for mostly what it's worth, flopped. But to me, it's the graphics card I've been using for a long old time now. Now this right here is the AMD Fury Tri-X Mega Edition Nitro or something or other with more names than I really care to remember. But not just is it any over the top half a decade old graphics card, it is my very own half a decade old graphics card, which explains why it looks like it's been in use and it's dusty and grimy and, well, it's just what you'd expect from a used graphics card. I nicked it out of my own PC just now to record this bit of footage, so what's all the fuss about? Why are we talking about the AMD Fury? Well, the R9 Fury was originally released in July of 2015 and was a beefy chunk of a card, being based on the Fiji architecture and a decent step up architecturally from AMD's previous offerings. Utilizing 4GB of HBM memory, containing an insanely high 3584 shading units, which must be at least 10 times more than what I usually end up reviewing, with clock speeds sitting around 1 GHz, or 1025 MHz when it's boosting as high as it can, it was a legitimately competitive card. But despite all this, there was a downside. The TDP. See, albeit not an inefficient card, as Fiji as an architecture can be quite good, this poor GPU was host to some of AMD's worst overvolting. Running at a TDP of 275 watts, it never really needed. So before we jump right into the benchmarks, I am going to give this a quick clean and some fresh thermal paste. Because honestly, this was bought as an X display model and I haven't bothered to clean it or change the thermal paste since I got it. It never actually got hot under my ownership, I think they use pretty decent thermal paste. In fact, now I've recorded this, I can tell you that the thermal paste they used was still pretty decent, so I probably didn't need to change it, but we want some sweet shots of that HBM memory that was unique to the Fury at the time. Now the reason this card is often held in such a high place is it's generally considered one of the last times AMD was majorly competitive in the high end, with their Fury and Fury X cards. See, we hear about these quite a lot of the time, unlike what would follow it, with Vega fading into obscurity in all but its mobile forms pretty quick. I mean, I don't hear about anyone recommending it at all nowadays, because it's not actually that good value in any way. Unless it's a laptop, those actually tend to be pretty good. But still, you hear a lot of different things about the AMD Fury, both good and bad, and both with rather good reasons. Where better to start, though, than with the negative? What gets brought up quite a lot when the AMD Fury is discussed? See, not long after its release, games became rather more intensive. Not so much in terms of rasterization, but more so in terms of VRAM usage. Something that was maxed out at 4GB on all Fury-based cards, because this was the first generation of HBM, and you couldn't get any more than 4GB, even on the quite rare and quite expensive Pro Duo cards, which was like two AMD Furies on one card, it had 8 gigabytes of onboard memory. But unless you had a very specific application that could address those 4 gigabyte banks individually, you were pretty much stuck with it as a 4 gigabyte card. When you consider that it also had some pretty bad driver support, where it seemed like AMD had all but forgotten about their AMD Fury, there was a solid 4 to 5 months where AMD's 2020 drivers just didn't work properly on this card. Most games would give you a black screen, most applications would give you a black screen, sometimes the PC would blue screen, and other AMD Fury based issues that happened on more AMD cards this year, and honestly I'm still a little bit annoyed at them for doing that. Really, there should be a priority on stability over pushing out features that aren't even going to work because you can't use them. These drivers should have been delayed 6 months on these older cards, yet we just had to rely on using older 2019 drivers for a solid 4-5 to five months. Still, it probably seems like I'm complaining about this card quite a lot, and don't worry, there's more. AMD originally preached this card as an overclocker's dream. Thing is, they don't really budge clockwise, at least not in my experience. So what we ended up with was a rather hot, rather bottlenecked card that AMD forgot about so much they left it without drivers for far too long. 
So where is the positive side? Is there actually any redeeming qualities? That power consumption though? Forget about it ever being a real thing, AMD's drivers do allow for undervolting really simply, and given that they managed to squeeze this entire card down to 150 watt power envelope with the Fury Nano, most if not all cards can get somewhat near this figure. It doesn't take long to undervolt, it's not hard to do, and honestly I will not forgive AMD for the power consumption on this generation of cards. I've had Tonga cards, I've had the Fiji cards, even Polaris and Vega cards are running far too higher voltages and run more stable and with better performance when undervolted. Yes, I know the RTG division is struggling and needs to push out more graphics cards, as many as possible, to keep the company afloat like they had to do, but the fact is, they refresh cards with higher power consumption for 1 to 3 FPS gains. It's ridiculous. Anyway, enough with that annoyance. If you want to hear more about that, I can always do a video on how much it annoys me. Still, the VRAM is definitely a limit. I'm not going to lie about that. But provided you are careful and don't go sticking everything on Ultra, this card is certainly going to surprise you at high and the medium mark. You see, a lot of these cards are very competitive, provided you don't go whacking every game on Ultra. Drivers, albeit hit and miss, do give you a lot of options, and with up-to-date gaming optimizations, which is nice. And it has the best, or near enough the best, AMD VCE support, which was decent back in the day in 2015, but, you know, compared to Nvidia, it sort of sucks now. Still, decent to have it there as a feature set, and I will touch more on that later on. But that isn't exactly what you came to this video for, and it has been good to probably hear out some of the advantages and negatives, but what you probably do want to care about is one of its most impressive areas, the actual gaming performance. Starting with the game I've been playing the most at the moment, mostly on live streams, is Bannerlord, which although a very new and demanding game, runs really well even into the heavier and larger battles. Most settings were set to high, but a few of the more VRAM intensive ones were turned down to medium, not that you really noticed the drop in quality at all. Still, with these compromising settings, we saw 60 plus FPS a lot of the time, and a really nice 1440p resolution used, which is the minimum you'll be seeing here today. Alternating to something a tad older than Bannerlord, but still something people like to see running on the ultra high settings, mostly meaning very high with most of the additional settings turned on, we can't forget about that 1440p resolution as well. Even so, we went on a high octane chase all over the city, giving plenty of opportunity for the frame rate to tank, with lots of explosions and general stuff going on, and still the game stayed very, very smooth. The only thing I did turn down was tessellation, which when on Ultra can hurt the frame rate on the Fury more than you'd think, because AMD hadn't quite figured out tessellation back then, and it did cripple them compared to Nvidia cards, so I opted for high instead of ultra on that setting. Still, I can't see any difference, and I doubt you would either. On to a far newer Rockstar game with Red Dead Redemption 2, and this was definitely a bit intense for the poor little AMD Fury. Although, with a similar state of settings to Bannerlord, another 2020 release, most settings were on the high settings, as they didn't prove too heavy on the 4GB of VRAM, Things, however, like textures, were relegated to medium settings. The game did look insanely good, however it still proved very intensive. I did opt to record the footage at 30fps because of this, as it was a bit intensive. Still, the game looked and ran extremely smooth, and given I use a FreeSync monitor, hitting that 55fps mark a lot of the time, and bouncing around that 50fps figure, was really, really nice to look at. The performance in this game here is always surprising people when I speak about it because they don't expect it to run that well on the AMD Fury, especially with these settings and that resolution, but it's all about finding the right settings that work. Up next is some gaming from around the car's release, or at least an example of the type of performance you'd see on release, with Fable Anniversary running maxed out in the 4K resolution with a frame rate well in excess of 100 FPS most of the time. Given that a lot of titles I run usually sort of are about this age, it gives you an idea of why I still use this card. Still, I don't tend to use 4K that much, but it's nice to know if I ever needed to. Well, it works very well. 
Modern strategy games like Civ 6 also tend to run really well. Probably a far better test than running something like Red Alert 2 or Generals, which will also run well, but back to more modern stuff. With frame rate usually in excess of 60 FPS well into the late game, the game didn't seem keen on going much higher than this though. But given its strategic origins, this really shouldn't be a problem for anyone as hitting 60 FPS is probably fine. It's worth noting though that this was with DX11, but performance didn't seem to change a great deal when using other APIs. Simple modern games can be maxed out, games like Islanders run with no issues and a very high frame rate. I'm quite a fan of games like this, and despite its simplicity, it does look very nice. Still, pretty much any new indie game would run about as well as this, and that's most of the new games I buy, so tends to run well. CSGO is a bit of a pain to benchmark now, but utilising the benchmark map with a majority of high settings selected, we saw an average of over 300 FPS. I was debating having the bars fly off the screen to emphasise just how well this game runs on pretty overpowered hardware for it, but we are still GPU bound in this instance, so don't worry about that, my CPU has more it can give. But given that this PC has to deal with, well, you know, my pretty bad CSGO binges because I'm not the best player in the world, I can at least say that in a competitive context, it can do pretty well. And the AMD Fury holds up. Finally though, can it run Crisis? Well, other than how much this game still struggles due to it only touching two cores on my CPU, we did see 60 FPS most of the time. This was maxed out and well into 1440p though, and we did change between GPU bound and CPU bound quite often. Then again, Crisis is never a real benchmark unless you're testing hardware from probably about 2008. As a bit of a laugh though, it does work, and you can definitely get through the entire game pretty well. And graphically, it still does hold up. Finally, you'll probably want to see some synthetic benchmarks, and once again it does alright. In fact, the benchmarks actually seem to look smooth enough to actually be playable videos, which is something I don't often get to see with the benchmarks I do on this channel. Still, it's in an ideal position for such an older graphics card, but does confirm what most of us will already know. Any remotely recent AMD Zen processor really can do much better performance-wise than this old Fury. But hey, a couple of years ago, when I was actually upgrading to AMD's Ryzen for the first time, I was still using an R9285. Which is kind of a mini fury in a sense, even if it is just in feature set and similar release date. But still, that's just me talking nonsense. Still, talking about feature set, it is actually one area where the fury is still sort of kicking. Just not in any way that's compelling for anyone to actually go out and buy one. My PC is mostly a workhorse at this stage, seeing most of the time it actually spends in use, not running games, but when it does run them, it spends its time live streaming them. However, on my own PC I mostly just use the overkill CPU to do that, but when I'm using lower end builds, this graphics card does have built in AMD VCE, which although as I mentioned earlier pales in comparison to the new RTX NVENC, which looks absolutely insane, this can just about hold up for video recording and streaming at lower bit rates. I'll go ahead and throw up a few tests for you now, and the main thing this does allow is for video recording or streaming on very lowly systems. We've even used it on a Pentium 4 to do a live stream before, but take a look and see what you think. To get even more exciting, when I'm preparing my files for editing, or even just compressing things down to send somewhere and don't want to use my CPU for something because I might actually be doing something with it, what I can quite easily do is give this job to the GPU. And it can usually encode files at well over 200 FPS thanks to that HBM memory and VCE encoding. Pretty nice stuff. 
There isn't much else I can say though. The card is whisper quiet, given that the fans turn off at idle speeds, which helps with voiceovers as you can imagine because my PC is on the desk, and undervolted or not, the fans never really ramp up, with temperatures seeing usually below 77 degrees, even in a 45 minute Fermark test. So it doesn't really get all too hot. Yet after all these positives, I cannot recommend you buy the AMD Fury anymore. See the performance? Well, it's decent, and in a lot of instances, it ends up falling between high-end Polaris and a GTX 1070. In fact, it's probably just about on par or slightly better than what we've seen in the Xbox One X console, if it wasn't for that small amount of VRAM. Personally, at the settings and games that I play, I've yet to find it be much of an issue, but there's no denying that in modern titles, well, you're never even going to be able to attempt full ultra or even a full high preset. But once you find that comfortable mixture, well, what it can do, it does phenomenally. So it games alright, I think it games really well, and a lot of people have a skewed perspective of its performance because they have yet to see it tested with settings that suit the card. You can also undervolt it and make it pretty damn efficient, but where is the problem? Well, the price. See, this card hasn't got any cheaper since I bought it. In fact, it's actually got more expensive unless you can find one that's been traded into CEX, but the last one I heard someone try to buy from there was actually broken. Still, it comes with a two-year warranty. People are no longer purchasing this card for its performance or budget aspect like they were when I bought it. It's become more of a collection piece. And when you consider that the RX 470 is usually about half the price, or even less, well, price to performance just goes out the window. Throw in the months of driver issues that I've just... I just can't even comprehend how a multi-billion pound company can have this level of incompetence for one of their products. So, you know, that's quite annoying. But I like using my card, and I'm probably going to keep using it until AMD or Nvidia gives me a compelling reason to upgrade. And honestly, the only thing that's compelling me so far are some of those RTX creation features, but performance-wise, well, nothing really seems like high enough of a leap up from the Fury yet to compel me to buy a new graphics card. It's still lasting me well today. And that's what people don't understand. People are always telling me this card is bad. Well, no, it's not. It's bad value now, but the performance I'm seeing out of it is just as good as when I bought it. I haven't had to look at reducing settings down to low. I'm still playing in 1440p. I've got a 160Hz monitor, which was mostly because it was on a sale when I got it, but still, the point remains, it fulfills my needs well. But I am not going to recommend you go out and grab one. I've seen these sell for upwards of £185 on eBay this week. That doesn't mean I'm going to recommend you buy one for that much. Maybe half that price you could consider one, but still, there's much better cards out there today. So I hope you've all enjoyed seeing that the AMD Fury, it was never a failure but time has treated it far better than others would think. The thing is, time has also treated a lot of other cards quite well too, and those ones have dropped in price, not gone up. So thank you very much for watching, good night. So after a few years of people asking, I've finally made this video. If you've enjoyed this, please do like and subscribe, support the channel on Patreon if you'd like to see extra content, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.